headed down to Acapulco. I know I'm headed down to Acapulco with the long white sands where I might have a chance. Yeah, we're gonna head down to Acapulco. Is it not a strange fate that we should suffer so much fear and doubt for so small a thing? Name that movie. Nobody? Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. There you go. It's about to be disappointing. We've got to have some geeks in here. In case anybody doesn't know the story of Lord of the Rings from the books or the movie, uh, wizards and goblins and elves and all that sort of thing, and an occasional dragon, bad guy wizard dark lord called Sauron trying to take over the world, has lots of scary armies and weapons and fortresses. However... All of his power depends on the one ring that he forged. It all hinges on that. And to me, that makes a brilliant analogy to the belief in authority. Um, I was also very happy years later to find a quote from Tolkien himself saying that, yeah, more and more I'm leaning towards being an anarchist. So that was fun. So the catch is, you have this big, scary, dark lord with all his armies and things, but if you can destroy that thing, the rest of it goes away. Which is why there's that quote of like, we're having all these big, scary things over this? What the hell? That is what we're up against. Now, it's so easy when you look out at the military and the war machines and the police state, and you, you, know, you try to walk to the local store and you see fascists driving around fully geared up here and you know it's almost that bad it is that bad in some places in the US on occasion fascists everyone it looks like how could we possibly resist this this is what we're up against that is not what we are up against we do not have to defeat their armies we do not have to defeat their fortresses we are up against one tiny lie we are up against so small a thing however that so small a thing is a pain in the ass to break. And this also uh, works very well with the analogy in Lord of the Rings, because this one ring of power, the good guys get their hands on it, but you can't just break it, you can't just melt it. You have to take it back where it came from and unmake it. That is what we have to do. This lie that was planted in people's minds through years of authoritarian indoctrination, we have to go back into their minds where it came from and unmake it. And when it is unmade, all the rest of it falls away. Now imagine the battlefield. You know, imagine you're, you're at a war and people are blowing each other up, doesn't even matter which war, and you call a timeout and everybody stops. Imagine if you could press a button and all the guns are there, all the bombs are there, all the machines are there, but suddenly everybody on both sides no longer believes in authority. Suddenly they, they will not buy the excuse of I'm just following orders. Unless they personally feel justified in doing their actions, they don't do it. What happens? Both sides go, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't really know who I'm shooting at. I don't really know why. I don't feel okay about this. I'm leaving. Now the hippie version of this is, what if they had a war and nobody came? But there's a lot of truth to that. What if, and a lot of people say, look at all the guns and bombs and stuff they have. I don't care how many guns the government has. I care how many trigger fingers they have. And if you can remove that so small a thing from the minds of the human beings to which those trigger fingers belong, the trigger fingers leave and the guns are not a threat. So what we are up against, it's, it's definitely a challenge. I'm not saying it's going to be easy but we don't have to defeat the armies of the world. And I've said a million times that, you know, it's so tempting to look at Washington and say, there's the problem, the evil people over there and all their schemes, and there are plenty of evil people there with plenty of evil schemes. That is not the problem. That is not the solution. You don't have to do anything to Washington, D.C., or whatever your capital is of the human livestock farm that you happen to live on. What you have to do is take that so small a thing out of the minds of the livestock so they stop imagining that these rulers have any legitimacy. And 
So you can imagine the war example. You can also, you know, imagine a, a drug raid. Somebody, a bunch of fascists all, all in their happy fascist gear, about to barge into somebody's house because, well, we heard you're growing a plant. If you could, right before they're about to kick down the door, remove that belief in authority, and they could suddenly see clearly what they were doing. It's like, we're some people, they're some people, they smoke pot, we might drink beer. What the hell are we doing? doing an armed invasion because we kind of prefer this way to mellow out to that way to mellow out. Nobody in the world would do a drug raid if they weren't brain addled from the belief in authority. If you remove that, the SWAT team doesn't matter. They're human beings. They just go the hell home. So that is the target. Now, in the meantime, sometimes there's the necessity of defending yourself, including violently, and I'm afraid it's going to get worse and worse as, as the state gets more and more desperate. But ultimately, the answer has nothing to do with mortal combat. It has nothing to do with defeating their big bad armies. It just has to do with meltdown that so small a thing to release the people from the lies. Now, I want to do another quote from Lord of the Rings that I thought was brilliant. I'm glad it showed up in the movies. There's shootouts and there's big wars going on. And the, some of the good guys, I won't bother with the names, um, some of the good guys are there, and one of the enemies just got shot and fell down, and he's dead, and, and one of them refers to, like, the enemy. And this one warrior who doesn't love war, he loves freedom, and he's smart enough to say, I fight to get to freedom, not for the glory of battle. Battle sucks. What I want is at the other end is them to leave us the hell alone. But somebody refers to the dead guy on the ground as the enemy, and the wise warrior says, the enemy... His sense of duty was no less than yours, I deem. You wonder what his name is, where he came from, and if he was really evil at heart. What lies or threats led him on this long march from home? And if he would not rather have stayed there in peace. So even Tolkien understood, during war, it's the lie that's the problem. It's not... Uh, big bad, you know, half the world is evil. You know, now the, the, the state is trying to make everybody scared of Muslims. They all want to kill us. And last week it was everybody's scared of this. And now the Russians are all going to kill us. And it's just people. And the thing is, the lie works in both directions. You know, the Russian government is, those Americans, they're all going to kill us. And it's the same thing. It's just a mirror image. And it all relies on the lie in the minds of all the people. If that goes away, nobody goes to war. Why the hell would you do that? You would defend yourself if somebody attacked you, but you would never in a million years go to the other side of the world and start blowing things up because, well, somebody told me to. And that's all about giving up the belief in authority. Now, so, so far I've talked about how that so small a thing warps the minds of the enforcers. That is actually the smallest problem. The main problem is how that so small a thing, how that belief in authority warps the minds of the victims of the enforcers. In the US, there are 300 however many million people. A lot of them, the majority of them, feel a moral obligation to pay tribute to a ruling class that does destructive warmongering and Ponzi schemes and all sorts of evil crap. They feel guilty if they try to not get robbed. Now, if you're a robber, that's exactly what you should want, as someone who feels guilty if they don't get robbed. The IRS has about 100,000 employees. Only a couple thousand of them are armed. If not for this so small a thing in the heads of the victims, there is no way in hell the IRS would even exist. Imagine a gang of 100,000 people and only 2,000 of them are armed and they say, we're going to rob 200 million people and half of them have guns and they don't view us as authority. That's going to be a short battle. Most of us are never going to hear of it because they're only going to make one town over and they'll all be dead. <laughs> it is the victims who are giving what Ayn Rand called the sanction of the victim. They accept their role as subjects because in their head there is that so small a thing. And so they feel uh, the, whole, the, the whole notion of a law-abiding taxpayer, people taking pride in that. That's taking pride in the fact that I do whatever my master tells me and I give him the fruits of my labor. Ew. That is not something to be proud of. That's something to be ashamed of.
And a, a lot of times statists will say, well, if there isn't government, some big gang will take over, or little gangs will take over. And, so, and they don't understand the massive role that the belief of the victim plays in the equation. Because, and I say, okay, well then describe for me, if there's no government, there's no enforcement, there's no belief in authority, how's like Pepsi Cola going to oppress me? And the idea that, well, they'll build an army. Really, you're going to build an army out of people who don't feel morally justified in what they're doing? It's going to be really hard to find those people. And then you're going to oppress 100 million people with guns who don't think you have the right to oppress them? You freaking lose. Maybe you should stick to selling soda. Because you're not going to oppress somebody by force if they don't believe in authority. So, and it's... It's so easy to point at the nasty, evil people and say that's the problem. The problem is mostly in the minds of the victims. However, the only bad part is not that the victims allow themselves to be victimized and legitimize their own victimization. They then become cheerleaders for tyranny. Because the moment you believe there is a rightful ruling class that has the right to force its will on other people, why the hell wouldn't you go to it and say, well, I have some preferences and ideas that I would like the poor taken care of. And since you, high and mighty government, have the right to rob people, then will you please rob people to take care of them? The moment you have that so small a thing in your head, of course you're going to be cheering for evil. You're going to be cheering for violence against your neighbor. Why the hell wouldn't you? If you think it's inherently righteous and moral for the government to dominate people, You'd say, well, make them not do bad habits, make them support good things, make them control all sorts of stuff. Because if it's inherent, like, you wouldn't do it on your own because you know that's bad. But if you're actually convinced that government has the right to do it, why the hell wouldn't you ask government to control and dominate everybody? That's what every statist does. That's what I did when I was a statist. I wanted government, because it magically had the right to, to violently force people to fund the police and the military and the courts that I thought would be good. And never in a million years would I have done it on my own, because that would be bad. But this magical, mythical authority thing has the right. Why wouldn't I beg it to victimize my neighbors? Every election is this pathetic spectacle of two sets of slaves screaming about how the other set should be robbed more and controlled more. If you remove that so small a thing from the minds of both sets, they suddenly realize, oh, you're not my enemy. I don't have to attack you. I don't have to rob you. I can spend my money on what I want to support, and you can spend your money on what you want to support. And suddenly you look at the politicians and go, you're just lying bastards who are pitting us against each other. And without that so small a thing, we had no reason at all to be at war with each other. Conservatives, you know, liberals, whatever you want to call it, all we need for peaceful coexistence is we're willing to not attack the other one. There is no statist in the world who is willing to not attack his neighbor because of that little belief stuck in his head. And one of the things I, I love about Lord of the Rings, there's so many things that work with this analogy so well. And one is that everybody, when they have their hand, get their hands on the ring of power, go, I can use it for good. And, and now we really need to. Now it's necessary. Um, and the story is, it will always corrupt you. The ring has only one master. And at one point, Gandalf, the wisest wizard, like this, this humble little Frodo hobbit dude, says, I am scared of this, I'm tired, you take it, Gandalf, because you're good and you're wise and everything. And Gandalf is smart enough to say, don't tempt me, Frodo, I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe. Understand, Frodo, I would use this ring from a desire to do good, but through me it would wield a power too great and terrible to imagine. And the only people in the story who were able to not use it were the little humble hobbits who were like, I don't want to rule the world, what the hell? And the wisest of wizards who realized, if I rule the world, I'm going to be the bad guy. The good intentions on the way in will not change it. I'm going to be the bad guy. The only thing we can do is destroy it. And one brilliant thing I love about the story, too, is that Gandalf is explaining the only advantage, they have to take it like into the heart of the bad guy's territory to destroy it, because that's where it was made. And he's smart enough to say, we have one advantage, which is Sauron, Dark Lord, bad guy. It will never occur to him that somebody would have their hands on the power and won't want to use it. They'll just want to destroy it. That is the advantage we have. 
I don't want to elect somebody who thinks like me because somebody who thinks like me won't frickin' run for office. I want to destroy the power so nobody has it. The good news is most people are not inherently bad. I've said a million times, if we were up against 8 billion people who genuinely, individually are malicious and they want to attack and kill each other, I would just run for the hills and live like a hermit. You can't talk evil people into being nice. We are not up against that. We are up against people who have value systems of all different nationalities, of all different religions, who the vast majority of the time, they live by the non-aggression principle, even if they've never heard of it. In their daily lives, they know you don't attack people, that's mean, you get along, you cooperate, you, you know, here I am in Mexico, I don't speak the language, but I just went and bought a thumb drive. Neither of us knew what the other one was saying, but we smiled and said hi and did trade and it was all fine. Nobody tried to oppress anybody. I did walk past a few fascists, but luckily I didn't get accosted. <laughs> but all we have to do is not program a new value system into people, we just have to remove one lie, one contradiction, one superstition. And so, you know, it's tempting to think, well, they have this big set of ideas and we need to remove all that and give them a different set of ideas. And we really don't. We just have to take away one lie and release what they already are um, by taking away the contradiction. And I'll, I'll quick mention a thing I'm working on called the, the mirror. I'll show a brief thing of it. We don't have audio now, so I'll just blab. The purpose of this is to, to have a big interactive process where people go through this three-dimensional world and it helps them look into their own brain without anybody there to be judgmental or argumentative. You know, I do plenty of the judgmental argumentative thing on Facebook and stuff. This is a very different approach. Um, There are plenty of people in the world who are eager to throw their ideas and opinions at you, who want to tell you what you should care about, what you should believe, what you should think, and how you should live your life. But this is not that. Instead, the purpose of the mirror is to take you on a journey inside your own mind, to let you explore the inner world of your own thought processes. The mirror is not about what facts you know or how smart you are. It's about exploring what you believe, how you see the world, and why. An interactive process where the way you answer certain questions determines where you will go and what you will discover next. In here, you are the scientist and the subject. You are the doctor and the patient. In here, you will decide what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong. But be warned, while digging into the inner workings of your own thoughts, you may discover things you didn't know were there, things that may make you uncertain and uncomfortable. So the first, and perhaps the most important question, is this. If, for whatever reason, you weren't seeing the world as it really is, if certain misunderstandings and false assumptions were causing you to think things and do things which go against what you really believe in and who you really are, would you want to know about it? Then let's begin. This journey is best taken alone, when you're free from distractions and not in a hurry, so you can take your time and give thoughtful, honest responses to the questions asked, knowing that no one is going to criticize your answers or argue with your opinions. All of the questions are multiple choice, often just yes or no, and how you answer each question determines what the next question will be. If you're not sure you understand a question or aren't sure how to answer, choose more info. You will even be given chances to go back and change your previous answers if you want to. The purpose here is not to trap you or to see if you get the right answers. The purpose is to help you investigate and sort out some of what goes on inside your own head, to see what makes you think what you think and do what you do. You can also leave the mirror whenever you want to, and you will be given a number code so that if you come back an hour later or a month later, you can pick up right where you left off. When you're ready, hit launch to begin. So after that, it becomes an interactive question thing. 
um, where the way they answer each question determine where it goes next. And you go through this whole three-dimensional world. Um, you can find me later, and I'll talk your ear off about it. Um, but that's a massive project. It, it'll be months and months in the making. Um, but just a couple quick things. What anarchism means is so, you know, so many people miss it, and even anarchists do a bad job of, of conveying this sometimes. Because if you say no government, most of the world thinks, okay, so everything the government is doing right now won't be done and it'll be chaos and mayhem. And really what anarchism means is we remove one thing, so small a thing, which is the idea that some people have an exemption from morality. That's all. That is all it means. It doesn't mean remove organization. It doesn't mean remove cooperation. It means nobody has an exemption from morality. And when you put it in those terms, the complaints sound ridiculous. Well, how will we build a road if nobody has an exemption from morality? What the hell kind of question is that? How will we feed the poor if nobody has an exemption from morality? Well, you organize and you ask people, why the hell would you ask such a thing? And if people are clear that that's the only difference, we're just saying there's no rulers, there's no people, there's no divine right of politicians. Otherwise, we're people. We have the same rights, we have the right of self-defense, we can organize, we can pull off ridiculous miracles. I mean, look at this beautiful city over here. That was built by people voluntarily interacting. Everyone from the, you know, the, the manual laborers, the CEOs, the, every, everything under the sun, every little aspect of it. You can have hierarchy, you can have organization. Nobody needs an exemption from morality, and that's all that needs to be removed. Um, now, oh, tomorrow night I'm, I'm, I'm doing a seminar. I think it's actually just on this floor back around there. It was, it was planned um, pretty quickly, like during the event, where I go through a thing that is the island analogy I refer to, and I find it to be a useful way to... Um, to basically bring out the inner anarchist in people and show them that it's, they already are anarchists, they just don't know it. There's just sort of this weird thing rattling around inside their head messing up their thought process. Um, but otherwise, they're, they already are that. Uh, and I think on the, the Anarchapoco website, you can sign up for that. It, it's, a, it's a dinner and the, the event at the same time. Um, but we don't have, again, we don't have to re replace their set of beliefs. We just have to release people from the one lie. Now, I want to do a quick prediction. I would have done a longer version of this, but I'll be, I'll be quick here. Um, I predict, and you'll be a little bit scared halfway through this prediction, I predict that in a matter of decades, there won't be any events like this. There won't be freedom events. You won't see the anarchy symbol anywhere anymore. You won't see the voluntary symbol. You won't see the yellow and black flag. You won't hear talk shows. You won't see videos advocating these things. You won't hear anybody calling themselves anarchists and voluntarists for the exact same reason that today you don't hear anybody calling themselves abolitionists. Because everybody's that. Nobody self-identifies as, I'm somebody who doesn't believe in Santa Claus. Well, no kidding. You don't have to point that out. That's everybody. If you ask somebody, what do you believe in? I'm a round earther. You don't really need to point that out. <laughs> Being an anarchist will be that, because what the term means is there's this one stupid idea that I don't subscribe to. People aren't going to need to point out that I don't believe that really dumb thing that plagued humanity for thousands of years, because everybody will have outgrown it. It will have spread to the point that it's everywhere, and then you don't need the books and the videos and all that. I look forward to the day that all the work I've done for the last 20 years is completely obsolete and unnecessary. Nobody cares, because everybody understands it. <laughs> Quick show of hands. Who here was an anarchist 20 years ago? Who here was an anarchist 10 years ago? Five years ago? You can keep holding them up if it was <laughs> two years ago. Who here is an anarchist today? That's called growth. That is why statism is doomed. We don't need a master plan. We don't need like a centralized thing that we teach other people. And I think it's tempting, you know, a, a, a few quick things at the end. It's tempting for people to want to be in the I know something you don't mode. And it can come across that way. And I've seen a bunch of anarchists and voluntaries that sort of come across that way. 
I don't want to, like, I just want to release the people. We don't need to, we don't need to make them into something they're not. They already are what they're supposed to be. And I've even seen residual sort of control freakism um, in the minds of anarchists who are like, well, I'm going to tell you what to believe. And, and I even, I'm going to complain a little bit. I might offend some people, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> People have these intricate plans like, well, we have these dispute resolution organizations, which I think are a good idea, and other people give these complex talks about economics, which I think is good stuff. The thing is, if we talk as if you need to understand these complicated things before you're allowed to own yourself, that creates an obstacle. I don't, for a millionth of a second, pretend that I know how the world should work when everybody's free. So, well, how's this going to work? How the hell should I know, and why would you think I'm going to know? There's eight billion people in the world, and probably a billion of them will have a better idea than me. But it takes a change in paradigm for people to see the world that way. They're so used to hearing the master plan template that they're scared of the idea of, what if we're just people, none of us have the right to rule, none of us have an exemption from morality, and just the creativity and the compassion and the cooperation and the organization that people naturally do will solve almost everything. And we won't all try the same things. We'll try a million different things. And some of the solu solutions will suck. And some will actually work. And we'll move towards that. And it is uncertain. And that's what scares people. But I'm here to tell you, uncertainty and the chaos of anarchy has a way better track record than centralized, controlled master plans like Mao's Great Leap Forward. It killed 40 million people while he was saying, here's how we make society work. How you make society work is shut up and let people be people. And that's all you need to do. Just let them go. We only need to release them from one lie, from one superstition. We only need to release them from so small a thing. Thank you. I don't know if it's that or, fast, or, or, but... <laughs> or, 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 or some period of time. What is the one or two things that have to happen in order for, for, for people to come to turn around where we're all abolitionists and don't have to say it? Well, there's sort of... Uh, I know there's actually a study that says somewhere around 10% is usually where an idea just sort of goes and then hits everybody. Yeah, and what's going to get us to 10%? Wait, what's going against what's it? What's going to get us to that 10% flip? Well, this and that and us all talking to other people and doing what we're already doing, as demonstrated by the, the increase in people who do it. Um, but the, the main thing is just have other people out there exposed to it over and over again. Most of the world has never even heard these ideas. They don't even know it's an option. The entire spectrum of ideas they've ever heard is, you want a right jackboot on your throat or a left jackboot on your throat? That, that's all they know exists. So they need to hear it in as many ways and from as many different people as possible until they start to think about it. And you know, the mirror is my massive project that I'm trying to do, but there's a zillion different ways to do it and a zillion different people to do it. So it really is just keep spreading the idea that people own themselves and we don't need a master plan, which is scary to everybody. First it was scary to me, but then you realize, wow, I'm not anybody's subject. And it's sort of scary because now I'm responsible for myself, but it's also pretty dang freeing that, wow, I own myself. I'm not beholden to anybody. And to, to share that feeling and that idea with people is the answer. And it isn't like, I'm going to control your mind instead of them controlling your mind. It's, I'm just going to, I'm going to detach their control of your mind and then you control your mind. And that's all we need to do. Larkin, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Listen to the Mariette play at midnight. Are you with me? Are you with me?